thank you for coming tonight. This is a little seminar that uh, we have tonight uh, talking about hip replacement surgery, specifically the anterior hip replacement surgery. Um, we have a small group tonight, so you have an ability to ask a lot of questions. Um, I'm just going to run through the program a little bit, and then I'll open this up for people to ask questions specifically about their is issues. Um, my name is Dr. Unger, and uh, I am the uh, medical director of the, so of the Gildenhorn Institute at Sibley Hospital. That's our reconstructive surgery unit, our orthopedic center uh, at Sibley Hospital um, that has uh, now been designated as a center of excellence in orthopedic surgery in, in the Washington area. Uh, I wanted to spend a little time talking with you about what we have at Sibley Hospital. We have a really, uh, I think, an outstanding group of uh, uh, individuals who treat orthopedic conditions. Uh, we've been designated as a very high-level uh, hip replacement uh, center in, in uh, the United States, probably top 5 to 10 percent by the U.S. News and World Reports. I've had many awards and accolades regarding this. Uh, it's not just me who does the work at the, uh, the hospital here. It's a team that we have that is dedicated to excellence in patient's care and what we call evidence-based medicine, which means we just don't do things because we want to do it. it. Do we do things because we actually believe that we um, are following the leading uh, evidence that's available for orthopedic surgeons around the country? So orthopedic surgeons are involved, like myself, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, a surgeon who primarily does bone and joint surgery. We have uh, nurses who are dedicated to uh, guiding patients through surgery or getting them ready for surgery. They're called navigators. Uh, we have a, a coordinator uh, who is in the back there, Kathy, who tells me where to go and what to do. Um, she's our head honcho here. Um, we work with uh, patients, uh, internists, family doctors, uh, cardiologists, for those patients who need surgery, often they have to see those individuals to get cleared for surgery. We have a dedicated orthopedic uh, anesthesia staff who are very uh, excellent board certified ortho uh, anesthesiologists who are working with us to minimize the pain that occurs with this type of procedure and allow people to recover faster. And they're really doing a great job with that. And we have a beautiful orthopedic unit, dedicated unit, uh, if some of you have been in a hospital, you know we have a new tower that's essentially dedicated to patient care uh, with individual private rooms and uh, really first-rate uh, orthopedic uh, center. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, new techniques in hip replacements. Um, some of you may have looked at this before, some of you may not, some of you may just have you know, questions about why does my hip hurt, what can I do about it, we'll answer all those questions. And we're going to in, not only look at the surgical aspects of the whole thing, but try to get you to understand what we've done in terms of improving anesthesia and pain uh, after this operation so that you can have a quicker recovery uh, and less complications. So we're going to talk about new techniques in anesthesia for joint replacement, specifically hip replacement surgery. So I'd like you, obviously, to try to hold the questions till the end. We have plenty of opportunity. We'll probably run through this in 20 or 30 minutes. And then we probably have at least another half an hour for individual questions um, at the end of the presentation. And I'll try to answer all of those if I can. So uh, first of all, who am I and where do I come from and uh, what do I do? So I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Again, these are surgeons. I'm a surgeon who primarily does what we call arthritis surgery. Our arthritis surgery is obviously surgery involves usually the shoulder, the the uh, uh, hip and uh, the knee. Mostly what I do is hip and knee replacements. Um, so I'm the director, I'm the person responsible for the Gildenhorn Institute uh, Bone and Joint uh, uh, Health. That's at Sibley Hospital, that's our dedicated unit here. Um, so if you have any complaints, call, talk, talk to me <laughs> or talk to Kathy, <laughs> uh, and we'll try to fix things for you. I'm a, I'm a member of an orthopedic group, group called the Washington Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Group. It's a group of orthopedic surgeons that cover really all specialties in orthopedic surgery. We have an office here, office downtown in Chevy Chase. We've been in Washington for years and years and years. 
Um, I'm a member of the uh, American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, and that's that uh, AHKS meeting, uh, organization. And those are mostly the people in, in the country who do hip and knee replacements. Uh, so if you, if you don't like me and you want to go someplace else, uh, I would tell you, to make sure your, your surgeon uh, is a, an AUKUS member. Uh, he's, you'll usually get somebody who's pretty what, up to date. Uh, we have an academic institution here. We actually are associated with uh, GW uh, and Hopkins, and I'm a professor uh, at uh, both of those institutions. And so I teach orthopedic surgery to residents and other doctors and associated write papers and stuff like that. So it's a fairly academic institution here. I've actually been doing this for a long time, 35 years. And uh, I, I've calculated out approximately, I've done approximately 10,000 hip and knee replacements as well as other procedures over the years. So let's first talk about, you know, what a joint is, try to get you to understand why your hip or your knee might be uh, bothering you. Uh, so you should understand that uh, a joint has what we call articular cartilage. That's a special type of material. Unfortunately, it does not regenerate. It's like your brain. If you lose it, unfortunately, in your brain, if you lose it, you have a lot of capacity to make it up. But in, uh, in your knee or your hip, when you lose your cartilage, it does not grow back. And there is no regenerative capabilities now in articular cartilage in spite of what you may have possibly read in the paper or in the back of the US News and World Reporter on an airplane. Um, so these allow, the cartilage is coating the end of the bone, allows you to move your joints back and forth, whether it's your elbow, your foot, your hip, your knee. It's this covering. It's a, what I, for most patients, I describe it as sort of a covering of ice. And unfortunately, when you develop arthritis, you lose the ice. It's almost like you have global warming and you've lost that polar cap. It's a cushion. It's a very, very unusual sort of structure. I'm not going to get into what it is actually in terms of biomechanically or, or biologically what it is, but it's a really unique structure. And it allows your joints to move back and forth. So if you have a normal joint, you move back and forth. You don't feel any pain. Uh, it glides back and forth. But unfortunately, uh, when you have arthritis, whether whatever it's a damage from uh, previous surgery or an injury or just getting older and developing arthritis, you lose that cartilage. And as I said before, you can't get it back. So once it's gone, uh, it, it, causes, it causes pain uh, in your joint, which you see as a patient as stiffness, discomfort, inability to walk. You know, it's tiresome. You can't do the activities you want to do. You have swelling. And uh, uh, the, the outcome is essentially what we call inflammation. So if you look at a joint, you look at a joint, and you see on, on the side here, because we don't have a very big thing about it, here, so this is, this is a, uh, a knee, this is a cartoon, obviously. This is the thigh bone, and this is the shin bone, and this is the knee. Cartoon is supposed to show you that this is a cartilage, so it allows you to go back and forth, and it's a thin kind of material uh, that allows the bones to glide and forth. gets to the point, obviously, sometimes when there's no cartilage at all, and it's essentially what we call bone on bone. There's different degrees of how much arthritis you can have, but all of this causes debris to get loose in your knee or your hip. It causes inflammation, which you see as uh, pain and discomfort. And there's lots of different types of arthritis. You know, the most common is just what we call degenerative, which means our genes are not programmed for us to last, you know, 70 or 80 or 90 years. Uh, so our joints wear out, but there's lots of other types of arthritis and, you know, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or whether it's some other weird lupus or something like that, it, it all essentially results in the same, uh, problem. You know, there's different etiologies to it. Uh, some of them are treated with, uh, aggressive medical therapy, which can sort of hold it back over time, like rheumatoid arthritis. But basically what happens is the cartilage degrades over time. This is a very common problem. I mean, it is a very, very, very common problem. And it affects millions and millions and millions of Americans. And it's growing as a national problem. It creates economic issues for the United States because we have all these people who are 
getting older, lasting a long time, uh, and uh, they're having bad hips and bad knees. And the volume of, of knee replacements and hip replacements and treatments of arthritis in general is just growing leaps and bounds in terms of how many patients. Uh, we see that at our hospital here. We see that across the country. So lots of people suffer from it. It affects people of all ages, but obviously as older you get, the more chance you have of having a, a bad hip or a bad knee. Um, and unfortunately, females are a little bit more commonly uh, getting it uh, than males, maybe because they're genetics or maybe because they outlive all the men anyway, right? So, uh, so, uh, so when you have a bad hip, unfortunately, there's not a lot of good solutions that you can have for it. You know, most people that have a bad hip that have lost cartilage in their hip, they usually try the usual medical, what we call medical management, which is, you know, taking anti-inflammatory medicines or trying some physical therapy or maybe a shot of cortisone. But at some point, my experience is those things generally don't work and they usually get a referral to an orthopedic surgeon to at least look at the possibility of them having uh, being a candidate for hip replacement surgery. The good news is, I guess, the good news is that hip replacements, which have now been around for probably almost I'd say 60, 70 years. So modern hip replacement started in the 60s, in the 60s, with a doctor in England called John Charnley. Um, and, you know, initially they were revolutionary. I mean, people for years and years and years just suffered with very bad arthritis and couldn't do anything, and they were revolutionary. They've now pretty much been perfected. And I think today's modern hip replacements are, what I tell all of my patients, they're very durable, which means they last a long time. We'll get into how long they last. And they're very, the operation is reliable. Reliable means how many times when you take somebody to the operating room, if you have 100 people, do you have a great result? And the answer is very, very high percentage, quoted in the 99th percentile. So very few people have complications or issues with these procedures. So it's a very good outcome or a very good option for people. Now, not everybody wants surgery. And some people say, look, I'll try anything. And there are some other things out there. We can talk about it if you want in terms of, you know, trying to control inflammation through other, what we call orthobiologics and people looking at that. But by and large, my experience is, it's like the motor of your car. You know, once it goes, you try the Advil, you try the Motrin, you're usually gonna see the orthopedic surgeon and by and large, you can usually elect to have surgery. Interestingly enough, with other joints like knees and shoulders, you can tinker along with those for a long period of time before you sort of give up and say, you know, I want to have my knee fixed. So, but the hip is usually, people usually can't do very well with that over time. So again, total hip replacements are, is probably the most effective procedure in terms of a surgical procedure that orthopedic surgeons or surgeons in general do. So you have the, as I said before, a durable procedure, lasts a long time, reliable procedure. It's probably more effective in relieving problems than most other surgical procedures, whether you want to compare it to spine operations or shoulder operations. It, it is a really, I think, uh, tried and true, effective procedure um, that really has change the way people manage this problem. Because years ago, you know, they have to, you know, again, before the 60s, they sat in a wheelchair, they went to a, an old age home, and they basically were left to sort of, you know, not walk and, and suffer. But today, they can stay active physically, stay at home, uh, stay out of rehab centers or nursing homes for a long period of time. So this is a uh, very good animated picture. I'm going to go through this a couple of times to just show you about hip replacement surgery because what it is. So, um, so this shows you from a cartoon or uh, a, uh, a video of exactly how a hip replacement is done. Okay, so I'm going to let it just sort of run through and then we're going to go through it step by step so you can sort of see the various issues that uh, I want to bring out to you tonight. So let me see if I can get this. Oh, let's go back and I can't do that. Okay, I got it. Okay, <laughs> I don't see my, my little. So here's the muscles, okay? 
This is the muscle around it. And there's a lot of muscles around it. The standard operation is to go through the back of the neck, through this big muscle in the back. This is called the gluteal muscle. It's this big muscle in the back. And the standard operation is to split this muscle and go through that muscle and go into the hip. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that procedure. That's been done for years and years and years. But the more modern way is to go in the front of the hip, around the muscles, around the muscles without cutting through the muscles. So hip replacements can be done in very, you can do it in many different ways. And there's been, you know, like I said, for 60 years it's been around. People try to do it many, many, many different ways. So the back is called a posterior approach. The other way is going to the side, which is called a transcopic peric approach. And then there's the anterior approach. And the anterior approach is sort of, um, in my opinion, is probably the best way of doing the operation. And I'll go, get into that in a second and show you why. But basically, because you don't cut through the muscles and you don't go into what we call internervous planes, in other words, when you separate muscles apart, it's not only separating the muscles apart, but you want to make sure that the nerve that controls that muscle is not one nerve, it's two different nerves. You understand what I'm saying? So if one nerve comes down and supplies both muscles and you spread them apart, you're probably going to injure the nerve, right? But if this nerve, this muscle has one nerve and that muscle has one nerve and you spread them apart, you have very little chance of disturbing the muscle, okay? Not only do you not bang the, beat up the muscle, but you don't affect the nerve. So when you do this operation, you have to get into the hip. And again, as I said, getting in through the anterior approach is the best way to do it. And that's going through uh, the front of the hip, which is right through here, okay? So what the surgeon does is it comes down, and he's going to strip away here all these muscles now, and you're left with that arthritic joint. And you can see that, you know, that it should look like a cue ball, right? But it's not a cue ball. It's got all those crevices and cracks and so forth like that. So the first step, the next step is, and again, once you're there, whether he's doing it posterior or anterior, whatever, it doesn't make a difference, the same steps have to be accomplished once you're in the joint, okay? So the first step is to take away what we call the, the disease bone, the femoral head. So the surgeon will remove that what we call femoral head. So let me just advance that a little bit. So you can see the surgeon removes that femoral head. Now he's left, or she's left, with two, two areas. One is the socket, what we call the acetabulum, and the other one is the femur, the thigh bone. So the first step is going to be to clean out and shake that acetabulum, pelvis bone, clean it out, shape it, and then pr press into the bone what we call the shell. The shell is a piece of titanium, it's titanium and very special titanium because it's porous. It's like Velcro. And it's sized to various sizes. It comes in multiple, multiple sizes. So there's a machining that goes on in the operating room where it's sized up. And then the material, the, the shell, is pressed into the bone. Most of the time, it sticks to the bone. Occasionally, surgeons occasionally put a little extra supplemental screw into it. But basically, it sticks to the bone. Now, once that sticks to the bone, the bone grows onto it and it stays there forever. It lasts forever. It grows into the, in, the, the implant, the bone. It's equivalent today, um, I mean, I'm not a dentist, but uh, I've, I see what the dentists are doing and they're doing um, tooth uh, reconstruction. So sometimes they'll cap it, right? But other times they'll put a little titanium screw in your jaw and then they'll put a tooth on it, right? So that's a titanium screw, again, porous, that the bone grows onto it. So once they do that part of the operation, the surgeon then snaps in plastic. That's the thing that's changed orthopedic surgery. So it used to be implants would last 10 or 15 years, hip replacements. But about 15, 20 years ago, they took plastic and they changed the composition of it chemically. They actually did something called radiation. So they took the piece of plastic and they zapped it with some radiation and they found that they changed the chemical composition of the plastic and the longevity of the plastic increased by a full, probably tenfold. So it used to be 10, 15 years. Now we say, well, you know, it could be 30 or 40, probably could be more than that, 30 or 40 years. So that's the big change. 
So then on the other side, the bone is shaped, and again, a titanium piece with, again, the same porous material is pressed into the bone. And on that side, it's a, it's a little different anatomy. wedged in there. So surgeons have to hit it and they have to smack it into the bone, almost like they're driving a wedge into a piece of wood. And it sticks. And then the bone grows onto it. And then the last part is for the surgeon to adjust the leg length through this, what we call the head, which is this, this ball, the so-called ball. Most surgeons today are using That has no friction, no friction, no friction. So you have no pain and you can do whatever you want to do with it. So this is, again, the surgeon popping it back together in the operating room. And um, the surgery is then complete. So this is, this is, this is, this is an operation that's really, really, really common. I mean, I, you know, in the United States, I think there's seven, 800,000 of these done a year, um, the, but the the question is how do how do you as a patient if you're going to do this how do you get through this with less pain and a faster recovery because as a patient you want to have a good experience right you don't want to you you want to you want to have a good hip but you also want to get through this without you know suffering so so I think minimal invasive surgery the so-called anterior hip has changed that and what we call multimodal anesthesia. We have a program here called at Sibley, which we've sort of developed and pioneered, I guess, or uh, is called the ERAS program, Extended Recovery After Surgery. They use it in a lot of different surgical um, procedures today, but we've sort of, I guess, developed it more for orthopedic surgery and had very good success with it. Uh, in addition, we're gonna talk a little bit about the anesthesia. So anterior surgery involves a small incision in the front of your hip. You don't go in through the back of the hip. You don't cut any muscles. We can use x-rays, computers, or just general looking at it, vision and so forth like that, to implant the implants in the proper position. The advantages are that there's, there's little post-operative uh, restrictions. I mean, these hips are very stable, so we don't tell you to lie in bed, don't get out of bed. We let you get up and walk. You're out of the hospital usually in a day. And most people can get back to work in two to four weeks. So it's a pretty re a quick recovery. Now, not everybody wants to go back to work. So yeah, it's not a requirement. But, um, you know, if you need to get back to work, uh, I have some people going back to work in, you know, five to seven days. You know, some people want to, I want to stay out for a month, two months, three months, whatever. So it's not new. So, so I, this, is, this is really a, a, an interesting thing, is that this approach into a hip, not talking about doing hip replacements, but the, what we call the approach, the surgical way of getting there, is not new. It's not new. So this is an article in the journal literature, and this was, what is it, 1886. And this is Dr. Porter, and he described the anterior approach. And that was almost 100 years ago, right? Yeah, that's pretty long. So uh, more than 100 years ago. Yeah, I can't even count. Uh, more than 100 years ago. OK, so it, you know, it's been around for a long But he didn't use it for hip replacements. He was treating infections and battle wounds and who knows what they were doing back then. But uh, it, you know, it's not new. So people come in, well, this is new, this is revolutionary. No, it's not new. It's something that orthopedic surgeons have known about for years and used before, but now they're using it in hip replacement surgery. The advantages are, I think, and this is my opinion, that you have a better chance of equalizing your leg length, which is an issue after hip replacements. You don't want your leg to be long or short. You have better stability, so you can do more things. You have less restrictions you have less muscle damage, and you have a faster recovery. People often come to the office and they seem to be enamored with this, the table. So they read on the internet that some surgeon says, you have to do this operation with this piece of equipment called the table. 
And I just put this in just to tell you that this operation is not dependent upon the equipment, but it's dependent upon the surgeon, okay? So pick your surgeon based upon what the experience is, not whether he bought a table or went to a course last week and they were doing it with a table. Some people do with a table, some people do without a table. It's, it's, a, it's a piece of an equipment, so it doesn't help you, you know, so for some surgeons, that's the way they learn to do it. And that's, they like doing it that way. Other surgeons like to do it without the table. I personally do it without the table. If you look at the world, 50% do it with, 50% do it without. It's like religion. You know, some people believe in it. Some people don't believe in it. So as I said before, and I introduced, you know, we're, we're a, a patient-oriented orthopedic center here, but we're also an academic center. And I guess what that shows you is that we really try to put ourselves out as being sort of the leading clinicians, scientists in terms of uh, joint replacement surgery and orthopedic surgery. So uh, about six, seven years ago, we wrote this paper here. I mean, my residents wrote it and I helped them write it. And, and it was looking at, you know, this, the concept of, you know, Everybody says, well, you have less muscle damage and prove it, you know? So how do you prove it? Do you prove it just because you got better? Well, you know, maybe you picked your patients better. So this was an attempt to try to be a little bit more scientific about this, to try to look at what we call biomarkers. In other words, to look at um, inflammatory markers, which are uh, what when people's muscles get damaged, they have what they call release of these chemicals that in your body that you can measure to see if there is more inflammation or muscle damage. And our, you know, we went ahead and we said, well, you know, let's see if we can prove that this particular operation had less muscle damage by this objective criteria. Not just like, oh, I walked down the hallway 20 feet and you walked down the hallway five feet, that kind of thing. So this is, uh, and this has been sort of a, honestly, it's been sort of a landmark paper. It continues to be quoted in the literature. It's been verified by a number of orthopedic surgeons around the world. And what we found here, this is, this is looking at um, this enzyme, whoop, this enzyme called creatinine kinase, which is released from muscles when they're damaged. And the blue is us, the anterior approach, and the the well, other one is the posterior approach, the standard operation. And this is at different times. And you can see, at least according to the science, that we had less damage to the muscles according to the level of what we call creatinine kinase. So it, we're really proud of this um, uh, particular paper. So better functional outcomes have been demonstrated in multiple studies. Uh, you know, that's, this is, again, the more subjective evaluation. Like, you ask 100 people, do you feel better? Do you have less pain? Can you walk farther? And so here's a couple of the papers, and they've prospectively looked at this and found that the anterior approach has had better results. At the end of the day, 10, well, two years out, they're the same. So I'm not saying that your anterior hip is going to last longer or you're not going to be, you're going to be happier. I'm just telling you that in the short term, a year, two years, you're going to get better faster and you're going to have less pain and, and dis, uh, dysfunction. So how do you get through this? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about anesthesia. We're going to get into the ERS protocol. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, physical therapy. So our anesthesia at this hospital is primarily regional anesthesia. So we try to encourage everybody to have a regional anesthetic. That means we don't try to use general where we put you to sleep. We try to anesthetize you by numbing your legs, the chest down. Everybody says, oh, I don't want to do that. But we talk everybody into it, and they do much better. They have less blood loss, less pain, faster recovery. You don't feel a thing, know anything. You're sedated like you're going for a colonoscopy. It's been demonstrated in the literature over and over and over again that there's, it's a quicker recovery, there's better pain control, less blood loss, and better outcomes with spinal anesthesia. Now, not everybody can have it. There are some people who say they don't want to do it. There's some people who had back surgery. Some people with the anesthesiologist can't get the needle in there. But it's rare. So we try to talk everybody into it. And we really think it's made a big difference in terms of outcomes. The multimodal anesthesia, and this is so-called ERAS protocol, is, is the idea of trying to use 
pain medicines that are non-narcotic, collection of medicines that do not have the narcotic effects. You know, narcotics, as you know, there's all this opioid business going on right now. They're bad. I mean, most surgeons, most doctors hate narcotics. They hate giving out narcotics. And, and with surgery, you're going to have pain, but we want to try to address the pain through other what we call pathways. So oral medicines are used, and mostly oral, some of them are intravenous, to try to reduce pain through different pathways. So we, we sort of get at the pain pathway through different areas rather than just narcotics. And then we try to use a lot of local anesthetics that we put into the joint after surgery that are long-acting that really reduce the pain. So most of the patients that I operate on the next morning when I come around, they come around and say, I don't have any pain. You know, can I go home? Um, and, and they really recover very quickly. So what medicines do we try to use? What we're using now, we're using this drug called Celebrex. You may have heard of that. And that's a anti-inflammatory medicine. And it's a, it's a drug that's very commonly used in orthopedic surgery today uh, to reduce pain. We use this drug called gabapentin, which is a nerve medicine. Some people use that for neuropathy. Uh, we're using Tylenol, uh, intravenous as well as oral. Uh, magnesium is a, is a uh, uh, an element, you know, uh, that you heard of that also reduces pain. We use some IV steroids, which reduce nausea and discomfort after surgery. Uh, and we avoid narcotics. That's not to say you don't get any narcotics. We'll give you whatever you need, but we really try to avoid it as best we can. And usually we, it's very rare that we use what we call intravenous narcotics, where you're getting it through the vein or through the muscle. Most of the stuff is oral. And typically, patients take a couple of doses when they go home, um, but we usually try to get them off of it very quickly. The local anesthetic that we use is a long act, it's like Novocaine, it's called Repivocaine. Uh, we sometimes mi mix it a little bit with morphine and these other drugs, which uh, tend to reduce the, the pain for a longer period of time. There's all these cocktails out there that orthopedic surgeons are sort of fiddling with, but um, uh, the idea is that try to get a long-acting uh, anti-pain um, medicine in there. Patients usually only take a couple of doses of nar oral narcotics, and most patients are uh, taking this drug called tramadol, which is sort of a pseudo-narcotic medicine, and Tylenol when they go home. And that's, that's what they go home with. And usually within a week or two, they're usually taking very little medicines um, and uh, moving along pretty quickly. What about physical therapy? Well, this, this is the way I do it. So and and I would tell you in general, the, the trend is to try, try to use less rather than more physical therapy. Um, patients seem to do better. Almost nobody goes to the rehab center. Nobody goes to the rehab center. They're almost everybody goes home. So we use, in our practice, we use one preoperative visit. It's called a prehab visit, where my PA will set up a therapist to come to the house to watch you walk up and down the stairs and make some recommendations about getting up and down the stairs and the shower and so forth like that. Throw away that rickety chair. Um, usually you get one or two sessions in the hospital. So the therapists come around, work with you the day of surgery, sometimes the next day, help you get up and down the stairs. To get, up, to get out of the hospital, you have to go up and down the stairs. You can't, we're not, we'll let you, we're not gonna kick you out. We, we, but I'm saying the average stay is one night because most people can go up and down the stairs. Some people need two or three, whatever it takes, it takes. Um, and there are occasional people that have to go to a rehab. I'm not saying we'll never send somebody to a rehab, but we try to avoid it as best we can. And then when you go home, a therapist comes to the home for a couple of times, generally three or four sessions, and the patients come back to the office. And then they pretty much are walking on their own, doing therapy on their own exercises, using the bike, using the elliptical, doing their exercises. And about 50% of them at four to six weeks get some additional physical therapy. Not everybody, a lot of people in four to six weeks, they're doing great, they're walking around and uh, they don't need the physical therapy. Uh, it's, it's really not that intensive. What can you do after you get your hip replaced? Well, walking and hiking is great, swimming's fine, tennis, golf, aerobics, fitness, skiing. You can ski as long as you're not like a crazy skier. You know, I don't want you jumping out of, you know, trees and stuff like that. Biking is fine. Everybody asks about uh, Pilates and yoga. I let people do, a, uh, you know, Pilates and yoga, but I, you know, I, I think when you're, if you expect your hip to do what you did when you were 20 years old, you're probably going to ask for trouble. So, you know, you can't, you know, sit like your 16-year-old daughter on the floor 
uh, and put your knee up to your chest and stuff. I mean, you could probably get away with it, but you might, you know, damage the implant over time. It's probably not a good idea to do that. But you pretty much can do everything you want to do. How long will it last? As I said before, today's implants are very durable. And I think, you know, 30, 40 years is a reasonable amount of time. Nobody's going to guarantee you that. <laughs> but I will tell you that science looks pretty good at this point in time for a good track record for 30 or 40 years, uh, certainly 20, 25 years at the very, very least. So anterior hip replacement, I think, is the way to go. I mean, there's lots and lots of surgeons in Washington. and I'm not the only one who does this. Uh, faster recovery, less pain, more stability, less restrictions, and really no adverse outcomes. So I'm not going to have, you know, nobody can say today that, oh, and that's, a, that's assuming that you're going to somebody who does this all the time. As in all surgeries, you, you don't want to go to somebody who just learned how to do it last week. Whether they're doing it, no matter how they're doing it, you have to go to an experienced person. So I want to thank you. And if anybody has any questions about anything related to this, I'd be happy to answer the questions.